sort of attitude we have towards the lobster fishery now is really a post-World War II uh, kind of attitude. It's, uh, it, the fishery wasn't uh, what it is today uh, before that time. Uh, and uh, back in the day, in the 19th century, uh, Maine was a very important uh, shipbuilding area and uh, very important in uh, worldwide trade as well as the coastal trade. Uh, through uh, the 19th century, as, long, as early as uh, we have uh, records of what each state built uh, in the course of a year, uh, even before Maine became a state in 1820, uh, Maine was building more ships, more tons of ships, than any other state in the Union, uh, right up through the 1890s. Uh, but a heavy predominance of uh, uh, cargo vessels and fishing vessels. As many of them were used in Maine, uh, the small coasting vessels, uh, and in later years, uh, much larger coasting vessels uh, were used in, in Maine and New England. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but there were also many deep water vessels uh, traveling to other parts of the world, foreign countries all over the world, uh, that were built in Maine and owned in Maine, uh, but, uh, and occasionally sailed from Maine ports, but generally sailed uh, from the larger ports that you would expect to be involved in international trade, like uh, New York and, and Boston and Philadelphia and Baltimore and so forth. There were some, uh, well, there were some multiple uses. The, uh, the cotton trade that a lot of Maine uh, ship owners were involved in in the uh, early to mid uh, 19th century uh, was a triangular trade uh, that went coastwise uh, down to southern ports, uh, cotton ports like uh, Mobile and New Orleans, uh, loaded cotton there, uh, took it to Europe, uh, and very often uh, one of the things these vessels did in Europe was to convert into a, um, uh, an immigrant vessel. Uh, quickly slap together some berths in the tween decks and charter yourself out to uh, an agent that was selling, uh, selling tickets for a transatlantic passage <laughs> and take uh, you know, three or four hundred of these hapless souls from Germany or, or Ireland uh, and bring them across the Atlantic uh, to New York especially. This is, a, this is a, an example of the, the cosmopolitan nature of Mainers in the, in the 1800s. Uh, this is a fellow uh, named Captain Warren Morse, uh, who was from around here in Bath, uh, sailed uh, for uh, a, uh, a family of ship owners uh, named Sewells. Uh, he would have been sailing for uh, a company called E and A Sewell uh, he, that was located here in Bath, and the name of his vessel was America. Uh, and in 1866, he took uh, cargo from New York uh, that was uh, something like 900 cases of merchandise and 1,700 tons of coal uh, to Shanghai, China. Uh, and uh, we learned from his letters back to the owners uh, that uh, arriving in, uh, in Shanghai, one of his challenges was to uh, do something with a cargo of what turned out to be cart uh, not a cargo, but a few cases of what turned out to be contraband material, uh, which was firearms and, uh, and ammunition. Uh, and uh, so he, uh, um, in rummaging around in Shanghai, uh, discovered uh, a, a ship chandlery named Phobes and Company uh, that happened to be run by uh, some young men from Portland, Maine, uh, who he quickly uh, formed a, a uh, relationship with and the sort of fellow state of Mainers uh, uh, camaraderie and, uh, and they quietly took these uh, uh, problematic cases of stuff uh, off his hands, uh, paid a little cash up front and was, they were supposed to uh, send the rest of it when they had sold uh, the, uh, the material. It was supposed to be a commission deal uh, and I, I have to assume that they followed through. We have no, no documentation that they actually uh, sent the money back to Maine, uh, but uh, since they were state of Mainers and uh, probably somebody knew where their mothers lived, uh, they probably did. 